one more time. Personality tests are useless. So why do so many companies still use them? So the other day I got an email from a former student of mine. Did you know I was a full-time business school professor? I don't talk about that often. Dear Dr. Burkus, did you know I have a doctorate? I don't talk about that much either. Dear Dr. Burkus, thanks so much for your advice years ago in class on acing the job interview. I'm now at the final stages of the interview process with my dream company, and I need to take a personality test. Do you have any advice for acing the personality test and getting the right personality type to get the offer? I do actually have some advice about this. My biggest piece of advice, ditch the company. You don't want to work there anyway. I know it's your dream job, but it's going to be a nightmare. See, we use personality tests a lot. Now, okay, most of them we use for harmless fun. We take it with our friends to figure out what Hogwarts house we're supposed to be in and that sort of thing. But companies use personality tests prolifically. Somewhere close to two and a half million people a year take the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the most popular and also one of the worst personality tests out there. 89 of the Fortune 100 companies subject their people to some form of personality testing at some point in their career. And we use them for a couple different reasons. Yeah, we use them often in hiring because we think that we should have certain personality types for certain jobs, or we think that we need a diversity of personality types on our team. We use them for team building activities or conflict resolution because we think that if we could just understand the differences in personality between people, then we would end up getting along better or working together as a team. And both of those assumptions are well, they're wrong. Personality tests, most personality tests anyway, the kinds that put you into a certain personality type, are useless. They're completely meaningless. They're of dubious origin, dubious methodology, and yet we still use them time and time again. Like I said, most personality tests are of dubious origin. Right? Consider one of the more popular personality tests in the workplace is the DISC, D-I-S-C, personality assessment. Although to be fair to the people at DISC, they would say they are a behavioral assessment. And the idea of the DISC test started with a gentleman named William Marston. William Marston also did two other things. He was the one that did a lot of the early research in the now discredited polygraph test industry. Uh, and he gave us Wonder Woman. The Wonder Woman thing is actually pretty cool. We won't hold that one against him for sure. But he theorized that there were basically four different types of people, four different ways that people respond in certain situations. And then disciples of Marston's actually took that and developed it into a test to put you into one of these four categories. Most of this happened almost a hundred years ago. A, a hundred years ago. Think about the state of science as a whole, medical science and especially personality science, a hundred years years ago. The Myers-Briggs type indicator, for example, the MBTI, we, we like to think of this as a super scientific one because the people that market it do a great job making it look that way. But the MBTI started with two women, a, a mom and a daughter, who basically loved gossiping about their neighbors and other socialites. They had read Carl Jung and Carl Jung's ideas that there were three basic personality types. And for some reason, they added a fourth and started labeling everybody around them. Eventually, they developed a, a test that they could ask people to put them into these different categories based on these different dimensions. But again, we're talking about two untrained psychologists who were devotees of Carl Jung over a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, when we thought that giving lobotomies to angry or depressed housewives was a suitable cure for, for anything. One more test that is gaining in popularity and starting to make inroads into the workplace is the Enneagram assessment, the Enneagram of personality it's often called. Now, if you thought the DISC or the MBTI had dubious origins, this test is fantastic. The Enneagram sorts people into nine different personality types. And those nine personality types, well, those were basically theorized from a South American occultist who liked to get into hallucinogenic trances by taking mescaline and ayahuasca. You think I'm making this up, but I'm not. And one day believed that the archangel Metatron told him that there were nine different personality types. He mapped those nine different personality types along this ancient symbol and boom, the Enneagram was born. 
Later devotees, I don't know if they did mescaline or not, would develop a test that would sort people into these nine categories. But I think we get the point. Most of these tests are of incredibly dubious origins, and yet we still buy into them for reasons we'll talk about in a second. First, let's talk about how dubious the methodologies behind these tests are. So while most of these tests have dubious origins, their methodologies are even more dubious. Most of these tests, the ones that sort you into different personality types, all start the same way. They start with a theory of how many different personality types there are. In the case of the DISC, it was four based on four behaviors. In the case of the Myers-Briggs, the MBTI, it's 16 based on one of two areas along four different dimensions. Jung only actually theorized that there were three, but for some reason they added a fourth. And in the case of the Enneagram, remember it was the Archangel Metatron that told us that there were nine. So you start with how many different categories you want, and then you dream up a bunch of different questions that would help you sort out whether or not somebody belongs in a certain category. We're talking hundreds of questions. You write out all these questions, you start to give those questionnaires to lots of different people, and then you run a bunch of statistical tests to figure out which questions actually did sort people into those categories and which ones we can eliminate because they don't add any additional sorting uh, ability. You run all these different statistical tests and you arrive at a much smaller test. In the case of the Myers-Briggs, for example, it's 93 questions. And it, the end result is that now you can take that test and you can find out that you are such and such personality based on basically the scientific rigor of a BuzzFeed quiz about which Saved by the Bell character you are. The science of personality doesn't actually work that way. Legitimate personality researchers will tell you that there are no personality types, there are only personality dimensions. And every personality assessment that they developed is designed to show where you exist along a spectrum. Now, the most well-researched and most rigorous personality assessment is what we often refer to as the big five. Five different personality dimensions that most people exist somewhere in a continuum along. So instead of just one different personality type, you actually have five different ones. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And in the end, what you arrive at is a score, actually five scores, that show where your unique personality sits along these continuums. Now we should specify here that since they came out, a lot of these tests have added a little bit to their phrasing to try and look a little bit more like the big five. So the DISC will mention that it's a preference which of these that you are. The MBTI will actually give you the results where you exist on the spectrum of four different options, but that's in later pages of the report. The very first thing you'll see is still which of the 16 categories you are. And the Enneagram added this thing called wings, where now you're basically two different personality types, and later descriptions of it will say that all of the nine are represented in everybody, but to different degrees, which is, I mean, that's pretty much an admission that your sorting hat isn't putting people in the right Hogwarts house. And in trying to make themselves look a little more scientific, that, that actually speaks to why we believe them, at least one of the reasons we believe them so much. We believe them because they appear rigorous. The devotees of the DISC will talk about Marston, will talk about the psychological research that goes behind it, and, and there is a little bit there, but not enough to make career decisions or even run a team building event on. The creators of the MBTI will talk about their statistical reliability, which basically just means that the test actually sorts people into the right categories. They'll never mention, of course, that those categories are basically meaningless and not based on actual dimensions. And the Enneagram will speak to the idea that it's a 2,000-year-old wisdom tradition passed down from Sufi mystics, even though the Sufis aren't 2,000 years old, and the Christian desert fathers, even though those fathers wrote about the seven deadly sins, not the nine personality types, and none of those fathers believed in an archangel named Metatron. And there's another reason beyond just the appearance of scientific rigor or historical reliability that we believe these tests. Hang on. The reason we believe most of these tests is that when we read our results, our results read like a fortune cookie. You don't have a pile of fortune cookies at your house? You're missing out. I mean, watch. Tolerant and flexible 
quiet observers until a problem appears, then act quickly to find workable solutions. Is that the fortune cookie? Or is that the description of ISTP from the Myers-Briggs website? How about another one? Easygoing, self-effacing type, receptive, reassuring, agreeable, and complacent. Fortune cookie? Or the description of type nine from the Enneagram? I mean, you get the point. Most of these are written like fortune cookies or like horoscopes, and it's actually a well-researched phenomenon. It's known often as the Barnum effect. The idea is that you can appear to be dialed in, to be really specific predicting someone's future or predicting their personality type by giving them a, a written or a verbal description that is actually so vague it could apply to just about everybody. Um, that's why one of my friends and colleagues, Adam Grant, coined this term that most personality tests are horoscopes for nerds. I mean, they're literally about as valid, but about as persuasive as a fortune cookie. Why do we keep using them? Well, like I said, we, we use them in hiring based off this faulty idea that maybe there are certain personality types that lend themselves to certain jobs. We use them in, in conflict resolution because we think that if people could understand each other's personality, maybe they would get along better. And the truth is, there's not a lot of research behind either of these uses in the workplace. Every attempt to take even the, the most scientifically rigorous personality assessments, the, the big five, Ocean, that we talked about earlier, show that there's basically no correlation between your personality type and your performance at work. Now, a side note here, there's a little correlation between conscientiousness and your performance at work, but it's really not significant enough to be making hiring decisions based off. And, and there's also not a lot of research that suggests that understanding each other's personality types will lead to less conflict in the workplace. I mean, face it, most of the conflict on your team or in your entire organization is not the result of different personality dimensions. It's the result of really vague descriptions of roles and responsibilities, uh, diminished resources, so every department is having to fight for resources, really poor communication around timelines and expectations, and a myriad of other systematic reasons that put people into conflict. And just finding out that someone is a Sagittarius that's not going to be all that helpful. So now you see when I'm talking to my student why I'm advising her to skip that company and move somewhere else. I mean, yes, I get it that it is her dream job. But the truth is, if this organization thinks that they're going to pick the right candidate based on a personality type, or they think that they're going to manage her career based on where she fits on some bogus test, well, that dream job's going to turn into a nightmare. Why? Because that company is dreaming. Hey, thanks so much for watching this episode. If you enjoyed it, make sure you're subscribed to the channel because we post episodes like this as often as we can. And if you really enjoyed it and you wanna go deeper, then check out our totally free course, Three Days to a More Motivated and Aligned Team. You can sign up for it at davidberkuscom slash three days. We'll see you there.